doesn't love the circus? Trapeze acts, human cannonballs, contortionists, the lion tamer, the uh, tiger king, the um... Wait, are we not so into those anymore? Has any aspect of the circus fallen farther than the once hugely popular exotic animal acts? Lion tamers, elephants on parade, seals balancing random objects on their noses for some reason. Once upon a time, these were all the rage and an expected part of any circus. These days, not so much and for good cause. Yes, uh, I am one of those people who believes that all wild animal acts are inherently abusive. There's just no way that you can put a creature that evolved to roam hundreds of miles on the savanna of Africa into the back of a truck and haul that from town to town, forcing it to do tricks for your amusement and for that not to be abusive. But that was certainly not the attitude in early 1900s Coney Island and the designers of the Dreamland and theme park made sure to build an arena for the use of Frank C. Bostock, one of the most famous animal trainers in the world. And did I say arena? Honestly, it was more like a coliseum or a temple. The word palatial is used again and again in descriptions of the place and it is apt. This was a palace devoted to making wild animals do stupid tricks for crowds. Step right up, step right up, and see Frank C. Bostock's amazing Animal Congress and performance. Eh, sounds a bit boring. Tremble as the mighty lion tamer cracks his whips and bends the very beasts of the jungle to his will. I think I've already seen this. Cheer as the queen of the jaguars, Mademoiselle Morelli, commands nature's fiercest hunters to perform amusing tricks for you. <sighs> Look, there's like a 75% chance of an animal escaping or a trainer getting mauled. One season ticket, please. Frank C. Bostock was born in 1866 in Darlington, County Durham, England. His parents were James William Bostock and Emma Woonwell, and they were, as strange as this sounds, animal training royalty. On his mother's side, he was the great-grandson of George Woonwell, proprietor of the famous Woonwell Traveling Menagerie, which consisted of 15 wagons full of exotic animals, including elephants, giraffes, a gorilla, a hyena, a kangaroo, leopards, six lions, llamas, monkeys, ocelots, onagers, whatever those are, ostriches, panthers, a rhinoceros, which he billed as the real unicorn from scripture, three tigers, wildcats, and zebras. In the early 1800s, George Woomwell would travel from fair to fair with this cart-bound zoo and, and brass band and exhibit the animals to the English public who had undoubtedly never seen such sights. Unfortunately, many of these animals were from warmer climates, like, you know, Africa, and did not adapt well to the drizzly English lands, and their itinerant lifestyle roaming the English countryside hardly lent itself to one of proper veterinary care, I'm guessing, with the result being that, well, they died. A lot. That hardly kept Woomwell down, however, and he would often sell the animals' bodies to a nearby university for dissection or... Well, here's a story. Once, when Woomwell was exhibiting his animals at a London fair, a rival exhibitor was there as well. Unfortunately for Woomwell, his only elephant had become quite ill and died during the night. His rival, a guy called Atkins, promptly put up a sign that said his menagerie contained the only live elephant at the fair. Woomwell responded by putting up a sign saying that he had the only dead elephant at the fair, and London fairgoers flocked to his instead, their belief being that live elephants might come through any time, but when would they have another chance to see a dead elephant? Woomwell raked in the money while Atkins sulked. The menagerie outlived George Woomwell, and ownership passed down the family line until it came to Frank Bostock's mother, Emma Woomwell, 
who continued running it with great success, and young Frank grew up spending time with these animals on a daily basis. In particular, he was drawn to the big cats, and he grew to appreciate and to love them. According to Bostock, at the age of 15, he was greatly incensed by the menagerie's lion tamer's cruel treatment of the cats, and when one of the lions attacked the man, incapacitating him, Bostock used the opportunity to step into the ring himself, despite his father's objections, and train the lions in his own theoretically far more humane way. He was successful, and soon became one of the troupe's main attractions billed as the Boy Trainer. He was apparently quite sensitive to the lion's well-being, and used a gentler method of training than the previous tamer. In fact, he wondered whether it was right for him to keep the beasts captive at all, writing in his autobiography. It occurred to me that perhaps I was wrong in being the jailer of these friends, that doubtless their original freedom of forest, desert, and jungle was their right, one that could not be trespassed upon with honesty. I saw these animals back in their own, saw them crouching at night in hidden fastnesses, awaiting the coming of prey, saw tragedies of the jungle. I trace to authentic sources long records of these acquaintances of mine found on their own playgrounds dying and dead from hunger and thirst or the shock of the hunter. I knew my friends of the jungle suffered no discomforts with me. My problem then resolved itself to this. Should I recommit my charges back to their own and cease abetting further captures, or should I continue to guard and cherish my friends, thus saving them and their weaker neighbours from the certain evils of the wilds? Surely, I reasoned. Their better welfare is assured here with me. They never hunger, thirst, suffer violent deaths, nor administer any. Feeling thus, can I conscientiously abandon them, whereby continuing I may benefit them and others? The results of these and like deliberations was the decision to continue the work of my forebears. For what it's worth, I think the guy really did care about his animals, but managed to talk himself into keeping them as his primary source of income in a fairly self-serving way. However, despite his talk of humane treatment, the fact was that the animals were captives in cramped little cages, transported across the drizzly, dank English countryside, and they didn't want to be there, and they would take opportunities to escape whenever they turned up. In 1889, one of the most bizarre of these incidents took place. When the Bostock and Wombwell show rolled into Birmingham, England, one of the lions managed to shake the cage door open and jump over one of the keeper's heads before fleeing into the city streets. Did I mention that this lion had already killed one of his keepers in an earlier incident? Bostock and the keepers gave chase, but um, cautiously, trying to lasso the animal from out of mauling range, but the lion jumped into a sewer opening. As it prowled along the tunnels, it roared repeatedly, causing a panic on the streets of Birmingham. Bostock, of course, knew that this was an incredibly dangerous situation, that this lion had killed a person before, and at any moment might escape the sewers and kill again. So he immediately cancelled the show and devoted all his men to recapturing the beast. Hold on. Hold on. I'm uh, getting an update on this 150-year-old story. I made a minor error there. When I said immediately cancelled the show and devoted all his men to recapturing the beast, uh, what I meant was that he didn't cancel the show, but instead lowered ropes into the sewers, shot off blank cartridges, and pretended to capture the lion when he hadn't, and for proof showed the Birmingham police one of his other lions in a cage he wheeled out to one of the sewer entrances. Then, while a homicidal lion continued to prowl the sewer systems, he went ahead and performed his show, which attracted a huge crowd because of all the excitement. After the show, Bostock fessed up to the Birmingham chief of police, who, for some reason, didn't immediately arrest him for gross negligence and public endangerment, but instead ordered 500 of his men to meet Bostock at the sewers at five minutes before midnight. With revolvers, rifles, horns, dogs, and fireworks, Bostock and the police invaded the sewers. The police fired off blank cartridges and then, when they spotted the lion's glowing eyes, 
set off Roman candles, trying to drive the lion to the sewer entrance where an empty cage awaited him. When the lion refused to retreat anymore, Bostock's boarhound leaped to attack him, unfortunately resulting in the dog being horrifically mauled. At this point, Bostock himself decided to try to force the lion to move. To accomplish this, he put his boots on his hands and had one of the other keepers place an iron kettle on his head to serve as a sort of makeshift lion armor. Fortunately for Bostock, before he could put this terrible plan into action, the kettle fell off his head, making a terrible clanging sound that reverberated in the tunnel and frightened the lion so badly that it ran straight into a slip noose trap that had been dropped from a nearby manhole. The men in the sewers now used their lassos to tie the creature up and haul him back to the cage. Despite the insanity of accidentally letting a lion loose in a city sewer and then lying about it, or maybe because of it, I don't know, Victorians were weird, Bostock's reputation only grew. Soon enough, he was taking his menagerie across the ocean to America, where it proved to be just as popular, making Bostock's Grand Zoological Congress and Wild Animal Arena, as it was now called, a household name, and after a series of successful engagements in New York, where another lion escaped and killed a horse, and Indianapolis, where a tiger that had already killed two men attacked Bostock, ripping the flesh from his back, nearly tearing his arm off and giving him a concussion, he came to Coney Island, where up to 16,000 people per day attended his show, Apparently impressed by the lions and tigers, but really going nuts for the boxing kangaroos. Bostock at least diversified his cruelty. And it was at this point that he came to the attention of William H. Reynolds, the New York businessman and ex-senator who was planning to open the Dreamland Amusement Park in 1904. Reynolds knew that he needed a major draw at his park, so he contracted with Bostock to perform on Coney Island exclusively at the Dreamland Arena, beginning on opening day in 1904 and until 1911. Never one to rest on his laurels, however, during this exclusive engagement, Bostock franchised out a number of other shows under his name that traveled the U.S. as well as Australia and Europe and England. But at Dreamland, Bostock's Animal Arena featured several trainers of note, including Mademoiselle Morelli, the Queen of the Jaguars, Madame Aurora, the Bear Trainer, and, by far the most sensational, the dashing and brazen Captain Jack Bonavita, who was considered uniquely talented at working with lions, even more so than Frank Bostock himself. He was billed as the only man who would enter a cage with 27 lions, and his signature move was to surround himself with 13 lions in the rough shape of an armchair while he sat calm and composed in the center. Unfortunately for him, Bonavita had a nemesis among these lions, a cat named Baltimore. While performing in Paris, Baltimore attacked Bonavita, landing him in the hospital. He survived and actually attracted the attention of the Belgian princess who visited him in the hospital, and the two were married for a short time, so I guess that worked out for him. However, the lion Baltimore remained on the lookout for Bonavita, and when the man returned to the ring in Coney Island, the lion made several more plays for him. During the first season at Dreamland, a dreadful heat set in, which worsened the moods of both trainers and lions, leading to several incidents. On June 27, 1904, during the famous 27 Lion Act, Baltimore and another lion began fighting, soon drawing in the other animals despite Captain Jack's attempts at breaking up the fight. In fact, Baltimore used the opportunity to make some attempts on Bonavita's life, and other lions began hurling themselves at the cage bars as though ready to attack the audience members. Bonavita called for the other trainers to enter the cage with him, armed with iron bars, which they used to try to beat the animals into submission. So much for Bostock's gentle approach to his cats. But 
Even this did not quiet them down, and the show had to be cancelled. In the general bedlam, one of Bostock's monkeys escaped, apparently the 23rd one that season, and chewed through some electrical wires, plunging a portion of the light bulb encrusted dreamland into darkness. On July 31st of 1904, Baltimore and Captain Jack again clashed in the ring, but this time with truly horrific results. Once again, the day was miserably hot, and despite the incidents that had occurred only a few weeks before, Bonavita decided to try out a new act for that day's audience. Bringing only six lions into the ring, he began to put them through their paces. One of the lions was Baltimore, and he had no interest in working to please the crowd. When Bonavita unwisely turned his back on Baltimore, the lion leaped upon him, pinning him to the ground. Bonavita fought back, hammering the lion with one of the hated iron bars, trying desperately to beat Baltimore back, but instead, the lion caught his arm in his mouth, bit down hard, and according to a written account in the book Behind the Scenes with Wild Animals, crunched it until every bone in the hand and wrist was broken. Frank Bostock himself rushed into the cage, firing blanks with his pistol, and several attendants with sharp pikes followed him in. The combination of jabbing and pistol shots was enough, and Baltimore retreated from the captain, who was immediately rushed to the hospital. Captain Jack survived the attack, but his right arm did not. Incredibly, once he recovered, he continued to perform and train big cats and used this story, as well as his empty right sleeve, to add to his growing legend. Although one would imagine that he never turned his back on Baltimore again. For the next several years, until 1911, Bostock's Animal Arena remained a mainstay of the Dreamland Amusement Park, and over that seven-year period, animal attacks continued to the point that the New York Times began referring to them as the, quote, usual Sunday incident. A snake charmer was bitten by a rattlesnake. The jaguars turned on Mademoiselle Morelli. A sloth bear clamped his jaws on his trainer's leg, only to be sprung on by a tiger himself. And lions continued to try to maul their trainers with varying degrees of success. And so this parade of animal cruelty for the paying public continued until the fateful night of May 27th, 1911, when the Dreamland Park itself burned to the ground. I'll be covering this fire and its effects in much more detail in a future episode, but suffice to say that Bostock's animals did not fare well. Over 150 of them perished in that blaze. A terrible fate for these creatures who had inarguably miserable lives. Frank Bostock himself did not live long after Dreamland's destruction. He returned to his home country of England, exhibiting his animals in a traveling jungle, and incidentally bringing the American craze of roller skating with him, opening a rink in Sheffield. However, in October of 1912, he fell ill with, um, as the newspapers reported at the time, nervous exhaustion, whatever that is. He rapidly declined, and one week after the newspaper article on October 12, 1912, he died in his home in Kensington Mansions, London. He was 46 years old, he was buried two days later in Abney Park Cemetery, where his grave remains a popular site for photography, adorned as it is by the sculpture of a sleeping lion. Captain Jack Bonavita lived long enough to see public interest in lion tamers flag even the one-armed variety. He moved to Los Angeles and branched out into providing animals for the nascent film industry, even starred in a few unfortunately lost-to-time films featuring him and his lions. On March 9th, 1917, Captain Jack entered the cage for what would turn out to be the final time. It was a routine rehearsal, but on this occasion, he was not facing a lion, rather a polar bear. Details are scant, 
It may even be that nobody was around to witness the attack itself, but the effect was altogether brutal, with multiple wounds to Bonavita's head, including a broken jaw and multiple severe lacerations. Strangely, newspaper accounts credit a traffic policeman with firing the six shots that killed the polar bear, though they uh, do not explain what a traffic cop would be doing hanging around an animal trainer's rehearsal. Bonavita clung to life for a few hours before dying from his wounds. He was buried in the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, but there is no sleeping lion adorning his grave. Instead, it is entirely unmarked. 118 years after Bostock's Animal Arena opened on Coney Island, the world is obviously a very different place, and there has been a significant reevaluation in how we treat wild and exotic animals and whether it is appropriate to have them perform for our amusement. Although these shows do still exist, there's very little tolerance for overtly abusing them with iron bars or whips or the like. But as I alluded to at the beginnings of this video, personally I believe that these performances are inherently cruel, that these animals simply do not belong in show environments performing tricks for our amusement. More and more people are agreeing with me. Perhaps the most hopeful sign of change is that the Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus, one of the major holdouts of wild animal acts, ceased their operations entirely in 2017 in the face of protests against their treatment of animals. This year, 2023, they are due to return touring, but without the exotic animals, and I for one salute them for it. Thank you so much for joining me on this exploration of a forgotten part of our shared history. If you made it this far into the video, do me a big favor and leave a like and a subscribe down below. And if you're interested in helping out with the future of this channel, head over to patreon.com slash meet me in dreamland and sign up to contribute as little as $1 a month. Among other things, I've been keeping a production diary over there so you can watch me grow and improve as a video maker. Special thanks to Mike from The Party for voicing Frank Bostock in this episode. If you are into theme park history and oddities, and my guess is if you watch this whole thing then you are, uh, check out his channel. The link is in the description below.